thanks again for everybody for, for participating today. But what we really want to do today is go over some of the aspects of, of things that are occurring now in the European Union with respect to potential technical barriers to trade of the agricultural products that we send there. Uh, there's been some significant occurrences taking place over in the EU, and we just wanted to make sure that everybody had an understanding, at least a baseline understanding, of the types of things that are going on over there relative to what we need to be thinking about from how we're going to be proceeding, how we're going to be managing, how we're going to be strategizing from this point going forward with the products we produce here, actually, that potentially could be exported to the EU. Now, just a couple of things, first of all, about the EU and relative to their, the, the type of business, I guess you could say, uh, that we're dealing with uh, with the European Union, it's, it's still a significant market. I mean, you're pushing almost $12 billion worth of product that the United States exports to the European Union on an annual basis. So, and that, that's, that growth has been continuing to grow over the last decade. I mean, a 55% increase in exports to the EU over the last 10 years, that's still something that, that worth, that's worth paying attention to. So that makes the EU our number four overseas trading partner. So they are very important for agricultural trade in the United States. And you'll see down on the, on the left side there, the top five commodities, you'll see, of course, tree nuts are number one. That's far and away led by the almond trade. And then you'll see the rest of them listed here, but then you'll see things like there on number five, the essential oils. So of course, those sort of things are gonna involve citrus and that kind of thing for the oils that are one of the processed fractions from the, the, from the processing facility activities. And those sort of things that go to the EU, those are very top commodity that's exported to the European Union. So while it is a significant business for us, there's still a lot of things going on in the EU that kind of make it, well, challenging because of the, the, the situation they've got going on there with themselves. They've got a lot in the way of this, this migrant situation occurring pretty much throughout the EU, and, and they're struggling with how they're dealing with those immigrants coming into the EU and what they're going to do with them and how they're going to manage them and all that sort of thing. So there's a lot going on there. They've got a lot in the way of lingering situations relative to the financial crisis that happened when they were transferred to the euro and other financial crises that are going on there, which creates a lot of skepticism across the EU. And now the British have pretty much voted themselves to they're going to withdraw from the European community. So now we have you know, a lot of internal conflict within the EU as to even between the member states and how they're going to function along those lines. So while they're... they're Situations like this are occurring, at the same time, their, their global growth is, and their trade is actually growing at a slower pace than the economy as a whole. Why is that important? We'll jump right into the next bullet. Because of the fact that the EU is the world's largest importer of agricultural commodities in the world. The United States is number two, China is number three, but the European Union is by far and away the number one importer of agricultural commodities. And the United States is significant because we're at Europe's number two leading exporter. So, and while there's there are dozens and dozens and dozens of countries that do export to the EU, we're actually the second largest supplier to the European community. Well, and while I, you'll see it only accounts for about 10% of the European Union imports, like I said, of the dozens and dozens of countries, that 10% is still very, very significant for them. Their imports continue to grow. They're, they're, you know, they're just not, they don't sustain themselves as much as, it, as, as possible. So they're, the, the imports into the European Union continue to expand over the last couple of decades. And it's only shown signs that will continue to increase. And relative to some specifics that might be you know, more relative to the folks here in Florida, uh, relative to the vegetable in, in, importation that the Europeans are con, con, using right now, Right now, they're at about $83 million worth of product from 2014 and another $103 million from 2015. So that's another 25% increase on a year-to-year -year basis. So those sort of things are still very important. So we have to keep that in mind here as we're producing our crop here. And on a reciprocal standpoint, while we're shipping them pretty much everything, um, what we're getting back from them is uh, whiskey, wine, and cheese for the most part. So just get into kind of some of the, the distinctions and differences between what goes on in the U.S. and what goes on regulatory-wise in the European community. Um, first of all, I'll talk about the PPPs, which are plant protection products, and of course the MRLs. 
need to mention right off the bat um, that the European system is, is a very, very, very complicated system. It involves multiple groups, uh, multiple laws are involved. Some of these laws even are conflictory with each other. So it gets very messy very quick. But uh, one of the things we want to get you an idea of, first of all, is what's called the REFIT. And that's just an acronym for Regulatory Fitness and Performance Review. So what that really is, uh, it, it's just a legislative review uh, looking at existing laws that they have on the books. But there's an opportunity for inputs from citizens and stakeholders and trading partners. So that's what we're going to try to emphasize uh, with what these discussions are today, is that we have opportunities for input into their uh, decision-making processes. And that's what we want to really try to identify here. They're regulated by two primary laws. And, and I just, we wanted to bring these numbers up so you just be familiar with them. The first one, of course, is uh, Regulation 1107 from 2009. And the other one is Regulation 396 back from 2005. So we'll hear these numbers on a fairly regular basis. And these are the two laws that by and large drive the MRL and uh, import tolerance situations there in the EU. But what their whole, the whole idea of this refit, what it's really trying to do is just to look at the system overall, try to define where there's problems, where there's gaps, uh, where there's other regulatory burns that might be problematic, and see if they can't correct those going forward. Now, relative on the next slide, relative to the import tolerances, which are pretty much specific for the 1107 rule that we talked about. You gotta remember overall that um, the European Union is really not interested in, in protecting production or protecting trade. They're pretty much interested in protecting the perception of human health in the European community. So what really happened here with, <clears throat> excuse me, regulation 1107 is they made a, a switch over from a risk-based system to now a hazard-based, what they call a cutoff criteria. And you'll hear that, that term quite a bit as we go through the discussion here this morning. What really is going to happen with this hazard-based restriction situation uh, is that initially, of course, it directly conflicts with what's going on in the, in the, the regulation of the 396, which is very much a risk-based analysis and regulatory process. So what's going to happen, it's going to have substantial impacts on international trade between all countries and what's, what's, what, what the EU is bringing in from an agricultural commodity basis. And it's going to put substantial limits on plant protection products and options we here in the States will be able to use if there's a potential that any of that product may be shipped over to the European Union at any time. At the same time, the EU is going to be lowering their limit of detection, uh, or their, their, their requirements surrounding that sort of thing. So if you're, if you're below a 0 0.01 part per million detection level, uh, things get a little different. But if you're above that, you're going to be fully subjected to the entire aspects of all 396 and 1107. Um, the impacts that um, a, a group has analyzed for us at this point is that they've just taken, looking at what's included in this cutoff criteria, analyzing that with what the regular European imports are, they're projecting that the first year there will be an $83 billion impact of product that's imported into the EU relative to this whole cutoff criteria situation. <coughs> And that whole shift from the risk base to the hazard base, they're only doing this uh, for, for simplicity reasons on their side. Yes, it's going to simplify the regulatory process because, well, everything's going to fail. And at the same time, well, if it simplifies the regulatory process, it's going to be cheaper. So they're saying, well, this is simpler, cheaper, let's just do it this way and try to get ahead in that manner. But at the same time, it's going to be very, very problematic with respect to what's going on. So the bottom line, this hazard-based, risk-based, getting away from the risk-based situation, the cutoff criteria really raises significant concerns over EU productivity themselves and the import importation of agricultural commodities into the European Union. So yes, this most definitely is going to impact what we're trying to do to get them product, but it's going to impact what they're doing on their own soil too when they're trying to grow a crop. And also then along those same lines then, it's going to really impact the food security situation within the European Union. Union because are they going to be able to produce enough food for themselves if they take away all the crop protection chemicals? How, the, the, a lot of those kind of you know, suggestions or, or I should say curiosities still do very much exist. Now just to give, um, you're going to hear some, some weird terms I guess you could say that might, you might not be familiar with as, with some of the discussions today. 
So I just wanted to give you an idea of some of these sort of things so that they're not you know, to completely new to you as we carry on some of these conversations. The first one is what's the DG Sante. And what DG Sante really is, it's a doctorate general, and what the Sante really stands for is it's for the health and, and health and food safety. So DG Sante is a doctorate general for health and food safety overall. Kind of, it's, and they're, what they're responsible for, like it says here, for all EU laws on food safe, safety of food, and other products, consumer rights, and protection of people's health. So it's kind of like a combination between EPA, FDA, things of that nature. But within that, there are still different uh, categories within DG Sante. Uh, the three main ones are listed here, but it's really only the first one, the EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, that we're really going to have you know, customary dealings with because they're the ones who deal with chemicals, food safety directly. The other, like it says here, uh, deal with varieties. Another one is... Um, uh, communicable disease and other health threats of those, along those lines. So it's really the EFSA group within DG Sante that we're going to have the most interactions with, I guess you could say, going forward. Another situation, because we're not done yet, remember we talked about multiple agencies are involved. Of course, you've got the European Commission involved at the, at the same time as well. And the Commission is really the hammer in this whole thing. Um, it, it's a member state driven group. But at the same time, the members are not supposed to represent their own state. They're supposed to represent the commission as a whole. Um, and within the commission, you've also got, you've got the council, which basically just um, oversees thing that's going on with the commission. And then at the same time, you've got parliament involved as well. And when you bring parliament into it, that's kind of like uh, if we were to take decisions that were made by the EPA and send them to Congress, how are you really going to get in Congress that have to prove them first before anything can happen? You can see how tough it's going to be to, to get, really get anything done along those lines. But that's the situation that's working within the European Commission uh, that, that their system does use. So uh, it, it, it's very complicated. It's, it, it's very um, non-user friendly, I guess you could say. But it's a system that they have, and it's a system they're abiding by. It's a system they voted into place. So it's really what we're kind of going to have to, the hoops we're going to have to jump through at this point going forward with respect to things that we want to get maybe potentially um, improved from a regulatory standpoint and as far as getting product into the European Union that's still going to be in compliance. So at that point, I think we're going to just switch over to the main thrust of our discussions today. Uh, and a lot of this came from some meetings we had a month ago while we were in attendance at, at uh, some food safety meetings, and we also met with face to face with a number of their EU regulatory authorities, because a lot of this is, is really disappointing in that in, in that how it's really working out and the things that really happen, especially going towards this hazard based criteria, and it's only going <coughs> to complicate things more. We just really have to make sure we're jumping through the right hoops at the right time. Yes, Jim. Uh, yeah, that, that's very, yeah the, the third party, it's really, you might be getting advice from a third party, but it, we're, that's one thing we're going to talk about here today is what we're really going to have to do as far as paying attention to the regs that are coming through, um, seeing how the changes might potentially impact what's going on, because we've had situations with, um, I'll, I'll use an example, thiabendazole. A decision was made on that product, and the MRL was removed after the, they went through the decision process because of lack of data, and that MRL was, MRL was removed in 20 days. The regulatory, the, the reg had been on the books for more than 20 years as safe, but when they did their analysis and determined that there's still data gaps and such that they wanted to see before they'd approve it, they put a line through it and said, yeah, it comes off the books in 20 days. Mm -hmm. So if you've got product treated with TBZ, you know, how, you, how are you supposed to do anything with that at this point, but it was really a mango situation that was primarily dealing with there. I think I'll give Gary a call. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're over time anyway. <laughs>